Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is uh, Professor Ellen Armour, who's a chair of feminist theology at Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt University and directs the Carpenter Program in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality. Her research interests are in feminist theology, theories of sex, race, gender, disability, and embodiment, and visual culture, as well as contemporary and continental philosophy. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you, Gil. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I don't uh, have a lot of background <laughs> in the areas that you can <laughs> talk about today. Um, right. But as I briefly mentioned, I have a little bit of an odd background. I grew up as a, as a Catholic in South India and came mm-hmm. to the U.S. I would consider myself to be an agnostic. Uh, I think um, mm-hmm. the atheists are called agnostics, uh, confused atheists, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they do tend to do that that's right that's right that's right so so i just mm-hmm. want to put that out there so that people know what where i'm coming from and my bias okay uh i want to start with um your 2019 paper mm-hmm. uh justice for alan curdy uh philosophy mm-hmm. photography and the cosmopolitics of life and death Um, And you say here, uh, photographs of the body of a drowned three-year-old Kurdish boy from Syria washed up on a Turkish beach encapsulated the plight of refugees fleeing the so-called civil war in Syria with particular pathos and power. Um, Mm -hmm. Through what these photographs index, you say, this essay considers what they open up and open onto, the philosophical problematics Mm -hmm. embedded in the political issues uh, the refugee crisis raises. So they, there's a there's, uh, lot of different things here. Um, I know that you have an interest yeah. in, uh, in photography and, and really how pictures affect uh, humans and their decision-making processes. And so I would like to start there and then, and then move into sure. the other issues that you talk about in the paper. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, that, so that interest in my interest in photography is um, is as you say, it's it's in what photographs uh, mean for us and how they move us. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, or you actually quote me saying, um, through what photographs index, yeah. through what these photographs index, um, scholars of photography <clears throat> distinguish between um, what photographs index. That is, you know, their what I say, they're that, then, there, right. um, and um, and what photographs open up and onto, and what they call iconicity. Um, so, if you think about an iconic photograph, for example, um, on the one hand, uh, let's take the photographs of Alan Curdy. Um, they, on the one hand, what you see is what you get, right? Yeah. It's a photograph of a little boy dead, washed up on a beach, and some and a soldier picking him up after that. 
Um, but we don't really know much about that photograph. We have to have some context for it to understand it. Um, and that, but to understand it, to know really that that then there, we need more context. But to feel moved by that photograph, we almost need no context at all. Right. Um, it's horrific to see a little boy's body washed up on a beach like that. You add the context to it, and you realize that what you're looking at is a little Syrian boy who was on a boat with his parents, um, you know, trying to get away from a civil war. And I say so-called because, you know, that's true of all wars like that. We call them civil, but there's nothing really civil about them in terms of civility. Yeah. Um, you know, and and what's powerful about that photograph is the way it moved people, not just emotionally, but to take action. Right. And, you know, I talk about the uh, the dramatic uptick in um, assistance to refugees, particularly in Europe and Canada, that came about as a result of the publication of those photographs and their circulation on, so on social media and elsewhere. Um, so that, I think, is really interesting. Um, one of the scholars I write about or use in my work, um, or I guess it's actually a co-authored book, who are communication scholars, they wrote this book called No Caption Needed, which is about iconic photographs. Yeah. And they talk about iconic photographs as circuits of political affect and as resources, potentially, for the mediation of conflict. Hmm. Um, and that's what interests me about photographs. What do they, what do they show us? How do they move us? How can we look at them, look with them, look through them to each other in ways that can move us forward in, um, in relationship to the very serious conflicts that we confront in our time and place? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So I don't know what the right phrase is, Ellen. And it's something like a picture is worth a thousand words or something like that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the way that I, I think about this is that language is sort of a recent innovation. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you know, when we write things down, we are using uh, a very recent innovation uh, whereas Homo sapiens have been using um, their eyes and, mm -hmm. and, and graphical constructs, not graphical, mm -hmm. but pictures, so to speak, real pictures, mm -hmm. uh, to make mm -hmm. things. And so photographs, uh, I guess, uh, gives us a lot more information, perhaps, than you know, something mm -hmm. that we've done. And as you mentioned, even without context, and I didn't see this particular photograph that you're mentioning, even without context, I would think mm -hmm. most people will have a a, a, a reaction to it, right? Right, uh, right. Go seek context, perhaps. Right, right. Most people, but not everyone. And this is one of the things that's interesting about photographs to me, and particularly iconic photographs. Um, you know, they'll move us, but they won't necessarily move us all in the same way or in the same direction or to take the same action. Yeah. So, you know, I talk about and I'm interested in, um, you know, all of the people who were moved to um, come to the assistance of refugees in a new way, in a different way. Um, and I read for articles that describe that. But you can imagine, you know, for every person who looked at that photograph and went, oh, my, that's just awful. I've got to do something. There were probably 10 or 12 at least who went, oh, that's terrible and went on to the next photograph, <laughs> right, or to the next news story. Yeah. So that's, that's, also, that's also the trick, you know? How do we, um, how do we account for um, the, different, the different ways that the same photograph can impact us? Yeah. One of the examples I cite of that is um, actually, I don't know if you will know the work of Susan Sontag, uh, you know, kind of a popular in public intellectual of sorts yeah. about uh, photography. Yeah. And she talks about a photograph from the Bosnian War uh, that was that depicts another child, right, who's been killed, and a mother grieving over that child um, in the in the street. And uh, that fo very photograph was used by both sides of the conflict successfully mm -hmm. to marshal support for their side. So, what do we do with that? You know, this is the thing. Um, photographs do give us, in some ways, as you're saying. More information, 
right. um, of sorts. Um, but how we understand that information and how we take in that information is going to be shaped by all kinds of things that aren't aren't just about the photograph, but are about our own formation, our own social context, our own investments yeah. in different things. Yeah, I was just thinking, I want to get your perspective on this. So, you know, social media, uh, people are bombarded with uh, pictures. Uh, yes. Social media. And mm -hmm. um, it may have an effect on sort of down-regulating uh, empathy, down-regulating what we consider to be human emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, in some sense, you know, what you talk about is a, a group of people looked at that picture and say, yeah, that's terrible. Let's go look at the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suspect uh, the percentage of people who do that uh, mm -hmm. because of, you know, you think about Facebook or other social media channels. Right. That's what they do all day. They look at yes. the picture and go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're exactly right. And that's what I'm working on in my current book project is um, trying to deal with the um, dramatic changes in our, what I call our photographic lives, if you will, yeah. that have resulted from our new media landscape. Um, <clears throat> we talk about social media as our new public square. And it is in many ways, right? Or they are in many ways. Um, that's where a lot of us get our information. That's where a lot of us get our news. And as you're saying, that new public square is oversaturated with images, right? Yeah. With photographs. And it is kind of all too easy to, you know, to scroll past the ones that are disturbing and to move on to something else. On the other hand, the way that social media companies engage us um, is, you know, what they want is our attention. They want our eyes, right? Uh, yeah. They want our eyeballs. And what gets our attention is what outrages us most of the time. Um, it's what sparks some kind of really dramatic emotion. So, right. um, so photographs will do that to us. Um, and the photographs that register most prominently on social media, the ones that we, as we say, go viral, tend to be those photographs that, at least for a large portion of, of a given person's uh, social media feed um, or social media connections, generates that kind of outrage or some kind of very strong emotional reaction. And that, I think, is also part of what we have to reckon with, um, is that the business model of what um, Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about this, but, you know, I would speculate that a human being has a capacity uh, which is sort of fixed uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for, for reaction, let's say, mm -hmm. reaction mm -hmm. Um, but um, and then if you bombard a human being with, let's say, photographs, uh, at some point uh, the system is sort of going to shut down because you know yeah. if the hypothesis that they only have some capacity, some fixed capacity mm -hmm. uh, to empathize, to analyze, uh, to understand. Right. Uh, by eight thirty in the morning, you're, <laughs> uh, you're already saturated. Uh, I don't know if you have any evidence for anything like that. Well, yes and no. Um, so, I, you know, I, what I would love to know is whether there's evidence. What I don't have is evidence specifically related to photographs for that. But yeah. I don't know if you know the work of, um, of Sherry Turkle, who is a scholar um, at, at MIT. Well, she's actually um, retired now. Yeah. And she's written a really great book called Alone Together, mm. uh, where she studies the impact of, uh, partly of impact of social media and of um, robots, actually, too, on, yeah. um, on our capacity for empathy and our capacity to, uh, to live well with each other. And she, I think, provides some very compelling um, scientific, social scientific um, research that supports exactly those concerns that you're raising. Um, and particularly because of the, um, 
I guess there may be two features at least that I would highlight. One is um, the gap, if you will, between our embodied selves, our flesh and blood selves, if you, selves, if you will, and the screens that we interact with um, that are kind of there that facilitate communication, but also inhibit it to some degree. Um, yeah. And the other is the filter bubbles, right? The fact that we tend to be in our own little social media bubbles with people who are like us and who are like-minded and think like us. And if we're not encountering difference, if we're not encountering the and not receiving the messages that we get from body language, as we call it, right? Um, mm -hmm. That that's a kind of double whammy on our um, ability to to build connection and to build empathy. I think um, right. I think she's got some good, you know, some she's raising some very good concerns about that. Um, on the other hand. Another researcher whose work I use a lot, and both of these are uh, social scientists too, um, it, and this may be a name you know also because she does a lot of writing in, um, in uh, newspapers and stuff, is Zeynep Tufekci. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and she's got a really great book um, called Twitter and Tear Gas, where she tracks the uh, ways that um, social media have actually kind of accelerate and amplify our ability to connect to one to one another in ways that you know um, that promote social activism, you know, of various sorts. And she's particularly interested in the Arab Spring as a, for the thing that she studies the most in that particular that particular book. But she too observes that um, that there is a there that that. Those social media connections do not, by any stretch of the imagination, replace, they're not a substitute for real, embodied, full on, you know, physical connections um, at all. Um, she documents, for example, the ways that the social media presence of the Arab Spring and what it was able to do depended in part on the fact that so many of the people who were part of that movement were already connected to through other um, flesh and blood organizations, right? Um, and yeah. so, I, so I think that's that's evidence on the positive side too, for um, for the fact that we need to appreciate and maybe make the most of what our new public square offers us by way of ease of connection and so on, while still reminding ourselves all the time and being aware of the fact that it is not a substitute for um, for real flesh and blood connection. We need that flesh and blood connection to truly cultivate things like empathy, things like um, us understanding across the lines that divide us if we're going yeah. to uh, live well together, you know, moving into the future. Yeah. You know, more generally, uh, the the one issue, you know, one could argue that um, we are in the modern context, we are becoming less human mm -hmm. uh, against the definition of human uh, that many people might hold. Mm. So, in some sense, we could we could have different species of humans mm. coexisting. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and neither one would really understand the other. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because they're the set of assumptions, their operating principles. Mm -hmm. and, and we see this in large countries, actually, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, the way that and going back to the, the Syrian refugee question. Right. Um, you might find a group of people reacting in one way and a group of other people reacting exactly differently. Definitely. And uh, and you know it, it it's it's possible that they are different very very different from each other yeah. you know from a from a definitional perspective yeah yeah no i think that i think that's right um the one place where i would i would be inclined to push back a bit is um in saying that that i don't know if i would want to say there are different kinds of human beings or we're seeing different kinds of humanity develop um i mean there's a part of that i'm really interested in and i'll say more about that in a second but the place where I want to resist or push back is this is what it is to be human. You know, the tendency to, to, for lack of a better word, tribalize 
to um, to to break up into um, major divisions and to um, you know to demonize each other. That's as deeply human as the tendency toward empathy. So um, so I think it's I think it's a both and I guess is what I would say. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, just uh, trying to get your perspective, Ellen. So, you know, one way I I, I haven't thought a lot about this, obviously, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, suppose we say, you know, there is a level one society and a level two society, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And level two society is it, very different in the sense that, you know, the objective function, the, the social aspects of that, it's all very different. Mm -hmm. And, and suppose in the contemporary system, we find people who have graduated to level right. two. Um, th th that's a problem mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, like you say, that they're going to basically misunderstand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like extraterrestrials <laughs> you know, in some ways, right? So, so they're going to look at uh, information coming from the other right. side and say this this doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. to me and 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 really reject mm -hmm. that completely. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I totally get what you're saying there. Um and uh I I think we're yeah, but again I think I just would want to say that's that's been true of humanity from the very beginning would be my guess. Um I'm thinking about now I'm going to speak as a theologian for a moment. <laughs> um and yeah, yeah. if you think back to uh the story of Adam and Eve and and uh mm -hmm. In the Bible, right. Um, right. That story uh, is, you know, it culminates in um, in. It's really a kind of explanation for how and why division developed among human beings, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We get past the Adam and Eve part, and the first thing that happens is a murder between their two sons, right? One murders the other. Um, and then division after division after division kind of follows from that. So, and that's myth, I understand. That's not um, a historical account of anything, but it is a mythical account. You know, myth has some real power and truth to it. Um, an ancient myth that, that talks of, you know, it's describing ancient people's sense yeah. of the power of division. And it's, and that as the as kind of the intrinsic thing that humanity has been reckoning with and struggling with since the very beginning. Um, so, yeah. but you're right. I I do I do want to say come back to that again and say I yeah. think there are things about our particular time and place that make that worse, um, and that make it harder for us to find ways to connect with each other across those lines that divide us. And, you know, I think there's a good case to be made that, you know, social media is part of it. Technology is part of it. Um, you know, class divisions are part of it. All kinds of things. Economic inequality is part of it. You know, the long histories of, of um, racisms and, um, you know, all sorts of other kinds of forms of oppression are part of it. So, um, so I, I, I don't want to minimize it in, in the slightest. I think it is a really, really tough thing and we're and particularly tough thing for our time and place. Yeah, so, I don't know if this is right, Ellen. So, you know, um, if you look at 50,000, 100,000 years of human evolution, uh, like you say, we have had divisions all through it. We mm -hmm. had clans clash with each other. Uh, and that is what Homo sapien was really about, you mm -hmm. know, all throughout history, right? Mm -hmm. But the objective functions were pretty simple: food mm -hmm. and sex. There were <laughs> right. parameters in there for most of the most of our history, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the divisions that we see today mm -hmm. uh, are not that simple, mm -hmm. right? And, and so. I don't know if there's a direct relationship to, you know, sort of the homo sapien attitude of mm -hmm. utility maximization from the beginning based on simple parameters right. to, to now right. where they seem to miss, they, they seem to look at each other and they don't really see right. uh, themselves in them. They, they, they sure. see extraterrestrials. <laughs> no, like, no, no, I see. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. And, and yeah, and I think that is, again, I think it is a reflection of a more, you know, more, uh, well, I guess it's a reflection of human evolution in some ways, as you're saying, right? 
um, and that that evolution has brought us to where we are today. So the trick is now we're here. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do with this? Um, yeah, and, that's a complex yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a very complex problem. And um, and I guess to come back to photographs for a second, um, yeah. you know, just I think that's one of the things that that I find so interesting about about photographs and and maybe uniquely so because they have that power to um, to to bridge those divides um, in ways that I just don't see words being able to do, you know, yeah. um, to come back to your observation about the difference between language and image. Um, and so my concern is or my interest is how can we harness that power? How can we find ways of looking, ways of seeing that if we were to be willing to cultivate them, could cultivate in us in turn um, ways of seeing beyond those divisions, ways of cultivating empathy, if you will, um, and of, you know, finding ways to address, as I keep saying, these, you know, terrible divisions and huge challenges that we confront as a species and in this time and place. Yeah, I mean, photographs are unique in the sense that it gives you a flashback. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, mm -hmm. could, it could actually bring memories back. Yeah. And, um, you know, the modern human, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, it basically losing um, past memories, mm -hmm. right, as they, let's call it, evolve into right. this, this new thing. Right. Uh, uh, photographs, uh, perhaps, is a way to, uh, to to bring those memories back, mm -hmm. and and that that's powerful. I want to touch on one other topic in the paper, which is a completely in different direction. Mm -hmm. Talk about the politics of life and death. Yeah, and and this is about death penalty, mm -hmm. and and really a contract between the individual, right, and the state. If I understand this correctly, correct. Yeah. And, how does that play into yeah. death penalty um, debate, yeah. right? Want to talk a bit about that? Sure, I can try to talk about that too. Um, yeah, so um, if you go back to what we call now social contract theory, um, yeah. and that is the idea that, um, again, it's, it, it comes out of an attempt to try to reckon with how is it and why is it that human beings come together in this way and submit themselves to a state voluntarily, right? It's reckoning with a very different political arrangement than a monarchy, for example, right? Where, um, where the monarch is just, you know, the monarch's the boss and the monarch has the power of over life and death, right? A monarch yeah. can decide who lives and who dies. Um, so, there, you know, that's power as we, or state power, as we kind of most often think about it, where it's concentrated at the top and the subjects are basically just subjected to it. But what got people to come up with this idea of the social contract is, okay, well, our modern nation states are actually work in a rather different way. Um, mm -hmm. We voluntarily sign on to a social contract, a contract with each other and with the state where we relinquish certain rights, right, and agree to abide by certain laws um, in order to get the goods that the state will deliver to us. And those goods are, on the one hand, safety, right, uh, yeah. freedom, you know, access to markets, all those kinds of things, right, that are, um, that are part of what constitute a modern nation state. Um, and and we, kind of, we kind of do that voluntarily. Um, so that, on the one hand, is what the social contract looks like. But one of the things that is true of the social contract, too, and one of the ways that, it, that monarchy, if you will, kind of um, persists even in a democratic nation state, has to do with ultimately this power over life and death. Um, yeah. One term of the social contract is if we violate that contract, if we don't do what we're supposed to do, then we, we agree to submit to a penalty, and that penalty could include the taking of our lives, right? 
And so the state still has that power of life or death over us in some way. Um, and on the one hand, so there's this tension on the one hand be between we this idea that in the social contract theory that we voluntarily signed on to it um, and the fact that we sign on to it proleptically, as it were, at birth. Well, we don't have any real, <laughs> you know, um, uh, we, we don't know what we're signing on to when we sign on to that contract. And we and so oh. in a sense, is that really a social contract in that in the way that the I mean, it's not voluntary quite in the same way. So how do we right. wrestle with that? Yeah, um, the so if the person signing onto the contract has no other alternative, mm -hmm. then it is it is automatic, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so, so the question would be: Is there any optionality that exists mm -hmm. uh, when that contract is uh, put together? Mm -hmm. In the modern context, I don't think there is there are any options, yeah, right? Not really. No, not if you sign on at birth. Um, you know, and this could be. I don't talk about this in the article, but this could be one thing that would be interesting to think about. Um, would be, uh, you know, this is a an instance where where immigrants might actually be the only ones who can actually sign on to the contract, <laughs> right? Quite voluntarily. <laughs> That's right. right, and That's know right. exactly what they're signing on to, too, right? You know, they tend to know, I'm thinking about, you know, immigrants to the U.S. in particular will tend to know know the, uh, um, you know, know the Constitution a lot better than uh, than a lot, a lot of citizens do, birth citizens by birth, that is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Yeah, that that, that uh, could take a, a, a very interesting research. So, um, immigrants, as you say, at least uh, appears to have flexibility mm -hmm. to walk away from a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, but it appears in the status quo that when they sign on to that contract, they're buying a box of goods, mm -hmm. but they haven't really opened the box yet. <laughs> <laughs> they were told there are a bunch of goodies in right. there. Uh, and uh, they are signing on, assuming that those goodies are worth something. Exactly, yep. Yep, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to touch on another uh, another idea here. So, uh, cosmopolitics, cosmopolitics, and philosophy. I don't know if that uh, am I pronouncing cosmopolitics yes, correctly? Perfectly, or perfectly, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so what exactly? What is the definition of a cosmopolitan? Well, it's um, it's again trying to work with this tension that's present in both in philosophy and in in our in the way that our that our global politics are organized um, and it's a yeah. tension between um, what we might call I guess between state sovereignty and um, and cosmopolitanism uh, so the very idea of the cosmopolite um, that's, you know, that's an old idea. It goes back, you know, you can hear it in the language, right? It goes back to Greek and Roman times of someone who is, um, but I'll talk about it in terms of uh, contemporary times, someone who can, you know, kind of effortless, effortlessly cross state lines, go from the U.S. to India, the U.S. to Egypt, the U.S. to Europe, and, um, and, and kind of fit in in a way. Not fit in in the sense that um, I can all of a sudden speak French or I can all of a sudden um, know what it is to be a Hindu, for example. But I know how to I know how to behave and to be interested and to you know to to um, to be curious about about the world and about the globe. And we have a, have had a system that has, for many of us at least, made it relatively easy to go from one country to the other, to be a cosmopolitan, right? And we yeah. also have in our global political system um, this uh, ideal em embodied in the United Nations, in UNESCO, which I talk about a bit in the article, of, um, of, uh, of I don't want to put it, values and um, commitments that transcend nations and that mm. nations sign on to as a way of preserving global peace, 
for example, right? Uh, yeah. So that, and, and there again, we have in a sense an enlarged version of um, the social contract. We could say the social contract on steroids maybe, um, but this time with full, <laughs> to a certain degree at least, full understanding of what you're signing on to if you're a nation state who signs on to become a member of the UN, right? For example, and right. you sign on to the UN Bill of Human Rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you make certain commitments. You know what you're signing on to. But what we find in reality is that it's really difficult to enforce those commitments, right, across um, when, when issues come up, like the Bosnian War, like the Syrian Civil War, um, like most conflicts that happen in our, in our world, right? And what happens yeah. most often is when it comes, it is we, we see that tension then between cosmopolitics and the politics of sovereignty. And so often, sovereignty wins. Sovereignty wins. So how do we right. wrestle with that too? Yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, and, uh, I, I, um, so a cosmopolitan is different from a globalist? Yes, I would say a cosmopolitan is different from a globalist, um, in a sense. Um, yeah. You could say that a globalist is a kind of, um, is a different version of a cosmopolitan, too. Um, yeah. I, 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 at least as I understand the, the cosmopolitan, there isn't the attachment to capitalism that I associate, at least, with the idea of a globalist. Um, and mm -hmm. if you think about globalization, too, as, um, as you know, really the, the relatively smooth, frictionless movement of capital across state lines, right? Um, and we, of course, we see yeah. that now. Lots of you know, giant multinational corporations we talk about now, right? Um, that right. that that's really the purpose that the, that globalization seems to serve, and it builds on in a certain way um, cosmopolitanism for sure. But it also torques it um, mm -hmm. in a way that. I'm not altogether sure works um, that kind of, I don't know, may, in, may enhance some of its worst aspects and minimize some of its better ones. Um, it doesn't always respect, for example, yeah. cultural yeah. difference or language difference or whatever. Um, and uh, at least with the notion of cosmopolitanism, is that you're you that idea is that you you welcome difference and you want to you want to embrace difference and experience difference as opposed to smooth it out um, and kind of erase it. So th that's the right. difference I would see between a globalist and a cosmopolitan. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, a cosmopolitan. Uh, if if she goes from the U.S. to France or Japan or India, uh, would consider those cultures uh, interesting. Is able to essentially mm -hmm. take in that culture and mm -hmm. fit in, as you say. Um, whereas uh, a globalist, I don't know, if globalist is the right term, mm -hmm. but there is a, there are a group of people who would say. You know, the problem we have is mm -hmm. we have 8.3 billion people. They all mm -hmm. they all have the same genes. There's <laughs> absolutely no difference. Uh, they, there are some surface features that they picked up uh, last, uh, you know, mm -hmm. few, few tens of thousands of years, uh, which, which, you mm -hmm. know, that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but most of the problems uh, in the world are related to this, uh, these surface mm -hmm. features, as far as I can see. And, and so a globalist, if that's the right term, would ask, you know, uh, these segmentation schemes that we have, countries, religions, mm -hmm. um, languages, uh, are they really mm -hmm. value-adding right. to society, right? right? Which is a diametrically that's right. opposite that's view of right. a cosmopolitan. And I think, too, I mean, it, you know, I th we were talking earlier before we really got going um, as part of this podcast about the fact that, it, that you were an Indian immigrant and that I had spent some time in India as a child. I think another difference, too, between yeah. the notion of cosmopolitanism and global understand it, is, you know, the, co the cosmopolitan is, um, is open to being 
changed and transformed by their experience abroad, right? By encountering difference. And um, I know I would certainly say that for myself, even though I was only 10 years old when I spent, you know, a month in India as part of a six month travel around the world, um, most of it in Asia. Um, I, I cannot, you could hardly overstate the, uh, the, the transformative effect, uh, lifelong transformative effect of that experience on me. And all of my family would say the same thing. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is also different between, that's a, a big difference, I think, between cosmopolitanism and, and globalization, too. Yeah. Uh, from your research, Ellen, it, 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 where, where, where do you think we are heading? Are we, are we getting more cosmopolitan or are we getting more global? Where do you Boy, think we are I wish uh, I knew the heading? answer to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I, maybe we could say we are at, I mean, sometimes I think we're kind of at a tipping point where we could go either direction. And, uh, and, and right yeah. now, I'm particularly... Uh, dangerous tipping point in terms of our ability to go in either direction. And it's not clear to me which way we'll go. Um, you know, of course, my hope would be, and what I would like to, my work to help us do is to, um, to urge us in the direction of cosmopolitanism and away from globalization. Uh, but I'm really you know, aware of just how strong the forces of globalization are and, you know, how can we, um, you know, how can we work with them, I guess. I don't think it's possible to just simply ignore them or, um, you know, or we can't yeah. come up with a brand new world order. That's not going to happen. That's not within our power to do. But how can we perhaps right. take, bring cosmopolitanism um, as a resource and cosmopolitics as a resource to uh, to the table as we navigate the complexities of globalization, you know, are there ways we can do that individually and collectively? Yeah, so so we have some micro mm -hmm. experiments, right? Uh, you can look at New York. I haven't mm -hmm. spent a lot of time in Nashville, Ellen, but I it think is, it's yes, very cosmopolitan too. Uh, and so we can look at mm -hmm. these micro experiments mm -hmm. and, and learn from those uh, because mm -hmm. they are truly cosmopolitan. Yeah, yeah, I think to some right. degree, you know, I think that was interesting too when you think about about both those cities. Um, they, you know, what's and if you think, and again, I'm thinking about the U.S. in particular. Um, they, they are cosmopolitan if you look at the total population. But when you think about the interactions <laughs> between specific populations within those cities, um, I think there's a there's a yeah. at least a good bit more of interaction in New York, I would say, maybe than in Nashville um, mm. between those populations. Mm. But even there, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case that folks in uh, Long Island, for example, you know, interact all that often with folks in Harlem. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, you know, there are limits even to, to cosmopolitanism in the most cosmopolitical <laughs> cities that we can think of. And it's certainly the case in Nashville. You know, Nashville is a very cosmopolitan place in terms of its populations. We have, um, for, among other things, we have the largest Kurdish population outside of Kurdistan in the world. Um, we have a very lively okay. and uh, vibrant um, Latinx population from all over different parts of Latin America, the Caribbean, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, yeah, and it's a yeah. religiously very diverse city, too. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that happens here. Um, but you really have to kind of go out of your way <laughs> to, um, to interact with that diversity uh, for the most part. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of organizations that try to facilitate that. Um, and often successfully, but again, it's going to take us individually saying, yeah, I really, I want that experience. You know, I want to go to the Ethiopian restaurant and eat Ethiopian food and maybe I'll meet, you know, Ethiopian people when I do that. And that may change me in some way. Right. You know, um, am I really, am I really willing to do that? That's where the kind of individual nature of it comes out too. Right. And then we'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about your, uh, okay. your good. order paper. Okay, 
This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Uh, Ellen, we talked about uh, a lot of different things in the first <laughs> half. Uh, we talked about photographs, social media, uh, individual to state contracts, and cosmopolitanism, <laughs> if that's the right <laughs> word. Yes. Uh, I want to pick up one of your uh, earlier papers, um, which is on a, a totally different subject. It's entitled Blinding Me with Queer Signs religion, sexuality, and post-modernity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you say this essay brings to bear insights from continental philosophers, Michael Foucault, I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly, mm-hmm. and uh, Judith Butler on the mm-hmm. science of homosexuality, and more importantly, the desire to use such science to resolve contemporary conflicts over homosexuality's acceptability. So mm-hmm. this has been a debate um, and to my own surprise, the debate is uh, in some sense intensifying, uh, Mm -hmm. essentially looking for a cause uh, Mm -hmm. uh, as if it is is something that that needs to be uh, analyzed that way. So so what Mm -hmm. is the status quo from a scientific perspective of homosexuality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's been a while since I've actually read up on the science, but my understanding of it is um, and I'm and I'm going to broaden a bit, not just talk about homosexuality now, but talk about um, kind of more, you know, as we've come to talk about it these days, um, LGBTQI issues, right? So yeah. lesbian, bisexual, gay, sexuality, gender identity issues, kind of um, particularly those that are non-normative. Um, right. And so one thing that's true about the science is um, the science of sexuality, which we could also call the science of gender is that it has uncovered, um, especially in recent decades, um, a great deal more complexity to um, sexuality and gender than I think the average lay person, I tend to say Jane and Joe Public, for example, (laughs) um, are aware of. Uh, So most of us think about um, gender and sexuality as rooted in nature, right? That is, you're either born male or female, and if you are born male, you're going to naturally act masculine and naturally desire a woman, right? Right. And that the flow from being born male to acting masculine to desiring a woman is just, you know, pretty effortless. And, you know, it's kind of like all of the... Being acting masculine, desiring a woman follows being born male like the night does the day. <laughs> um, and yet, what our what science is telling us is that actually it's a lot more complicated than that. Hmm. Um, and that in fact, at the biological level, it's complicated. Whether we're talking about chromosomally, um, yep. and at the embodied level, it's complicated. Uh, think about the phenomenon of intersexed people um, mm-hmm. and at the level of, um, of then, you know, and that's just at the level of embodiment, right? Now you yeah. add to that what we know about definitions of femininity and masculinity and what social scientists will tell us is that varies depending on time and place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and same thing with sexuality too, right? Um, your desire, you know, who you want to be with, what gives you pleasure also varies a lot. Um, and if you think about that, then we've known that for quite a while. Think about the Kinsey report from way back in the 50s, right, that, that yeah. documented some of that. Mm-hmm. So we, we um, have this very binary system where we expect you to be one or the other, right? And right. At every level, science, whether it's biological science or whether it's uh, social science, tells us that Things are just not that simple. Things are much more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, yeah. The, the human system is, is a really complex thing. Yes, yes it <laughs> uh, is. 
we haven't been able to really figure out, um, you know, a lot of different things, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the level of uncertainty and complexity mm-hmm. uh, is not something that we can really replicate in any physical sort of system. Right. And so, so I, I think, you know, in some sense, what you're, what you're saying is that the, the, the binary classification that, that we have been, uh, we have been all, you know, sort of taught about, mm-hmm. that binary classification is too simplistic yes. for, for such a complex system, right? right. What, right. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's too complex. And so to go back to the article for a second, Um, even though that's what science tells us and what social science tells us, there is also, um, you know, a a kind of, I mean, I I think, well, a tendency maybe, or where I'm pushing back on some of the science of sexuality specifically, is the ways that, that some of that science seems to me, at least, to be still, I mean, it's trying to complicate the binaries, but it's doing so in a binary way. (laughs) <laughs> so, yeah. for example, um, the studies of, of homosexuality that are attempting to find, um, to see if the brains of gay men are, um, you know, more female or male, right? More feminine or masculine. Well, you're doing, <laughs> you know, there you are stuck in a binary system again by, um, by looking for that and not recognizing that um, the association of male homosexuality with effeminacy is itself a cultural one. Mm. That's one of the things that's very interesting. If you go back, for example, to ancient Greece and Rome, um, where they had notions of, not just notions, but there you know, were men who were absolutely you know, having sex with other men, and particularly older men having sex with young men, mm. um, there, they didn't see that activity as effeminate at all, quite the opposite. What, what made you vulnerable to effeminacy if you were a man was having too much sex with women. That's what made you risk effeminacy. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, so, so I was thinking, uh, and so conceptually, science might be, um, it, it'll be difficult mm-hmm. for science uh, to, to understand this because modern science is really a reductionist approach, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we take a system, we, we, we sort of look at the components, we have ex ante expectations of what those components are going to do. Right. Uh, and, you know, that, that, is, that is how we, we think about it, right? So right. That, this is why we haven't been able to understand the brain really well, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, nor, nor have we been able to get anywhere close to replicating it in, in silicon, mm-hmm. right? Because right. if you look at artificial intelligence today and computer science in general, there's this concept that we, we take the brain and try to replicate that in silicon. And the way that we do that is by complete reductionism. Right. Right? It just doesn't work like that. Right. <laughs> and so if that is true for human as a whole, mm-hmm. um, you know, scientific approaches to understanding this uh, may never really, really succeed. Mm-hmm. Would you see it that well, I think scientific, I would put it this way, scientific approaches at trying to um, determine a cause for it, um, yeah. you know, I, I think may never succeed at that. Um, and in part, and again, you know, I'm not trying to malign the scientists at all. I think what, they're, what they are attempting to do, what, you know, what they want to do is, to, is to, to show us that this is just part of nature. This is just part of human nature. Um, but um, but that, as if that's going to solve the problem, the resistance to LGBTQ um, issues and people, um, and that issue, the resistance isn't, to my mind, I think, primarily in the end, an issue that can be resolved with science, no matter how far it gets down that line. Um, yeah. That issue is really rooted in, for the most part, it's um, it's in theology. It's in it's you know it's religious folk who are resistant, for the most part, to <laughs> acceptance of LGBTQ people. So, and they can get caught up too in this. You know, is it nature or is it nurture? Um, uh, you know how you know that line between science and theology is really one that that um, 
I guess it's not a line between science and theology. It's culture that connects science yeah. and theology. And so um, addressing the theological resistance is really the, to my mind, that's where, where we need to go. But that doesn't mean science can't help. Um, I think science does help in, in the fact that it points out, it makes us aware of these, the, the real complexities. Um, you know, one of the sources that I find most useful is a, a book by Anne Fausto Sterling, who's a, both a scientist and a historian. And she says, you know, it's really interesting. We talk about sex hormones, but why do we call them sex hormones, given all the things that they do in the body, right? Um, and that says more about our obsession in some ways with sex and sexuality than it does about the hormones themselves. And that obsession, I'm arguing, is actually rooted in theology, um, even though and it's rooted in Christian theology specifically because of Christian Christianity's role as a kind of um, in, in um, colonialization in just the role in the, you know, in the world. It's connection to empire, I guess, would be the short version of that. Um, so that's where we have to look, I think, ultimately to resolve those issues. Yeah, so, so I want to get your perspective. So Christianity's resistance to this uh, has been fairly uniform, I think. I, I don't know. I haven't really followed. But um, when I was growing up, uh, like I mentioned, in India uh, as a Catholic, um, I never actually came across this concept. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm speculating that there was an effort by the church, uh, this is pure speculation, mm -hmm. um, to, to hide it. Hmm. Um, and, and I, I don't know what they do now, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, do you think that could be true? Well, it could be. I think, I mean, I think in some ways it is true. Um, uh, but, I, but I'd also want to push back a bit on the idea that Christianity's resistance to this has been uniform. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually... Um, this is one of the things that's really interesting about the history of Christianity is it's a much more complicated history than that. So um, I won't get into all the details here at all, but even just to talk about modern U.S., for example, um, back in the 60s, um, there was a lot of, there were a lot of, I think mostly Protestant, but um, a lot of Christian denominations and Christian pastors and Christian groups that were very supportive of what was then called the homophile movement mm -hmm. um, that really wanted to normalize and recognize, um, you know, gay and lesbian relationships, at least as, as, um, as acceptable and as, you know, as healthy. Um, yeah. And that got pushed aside to a certain extent um, in the culture wars of the, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, but it, it, is, it has always been a much more complicated landscape than that, although the media coverage of it wouldn't let you see that too much. But I think the dynamics in the Catholic Church are particularly complicated, probably, because of the celibate priesthood yeah. and, um, and uh, because of, you know, kind of worries about um, that have been longstanding worries in Catholicism and in monasticism, too about um, the dangers of same-sex attraction and what that can do to, um, to a monastic order or what it can do to the priesthood. Mm. So it's complicated, to be sure, and it depends a bit on you know, where you are and you know, what denomination and so on and so forth. But it is, um, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, 1960, so I, I wasn't really aware of this. So what you're saying, Ellen, if I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. 1960s, um, we were more receptive, and then it, it subsequently got less and less receptive as time passed. Well, I, I don't want to overemphasize that and yeah. say that, you know, I wouldn't say that society as a whole was more receptive, but yeah. I would say that um, that there were, there were Christians and Christian organizations that were much more receptive. Um, they were probably in the minority um, at the time, but but they were actively involved in really um, trying to trying to help um, bring lesbian and gay relationships into the into the light, if you will. 
um, and think about the you know Stonewall that event um, as a as a kind of crucial turning point too for for a lot of folks. Um, but yeah, the the culture wars that started up in the uh, well, you could say that they're you know they've been with us for longer than that for sure. But we kind of talk about the culture wars as something really the eighties and nineties, I guess, um, mm -hmm. when all of these issues become more politicized. Um, yeah. And politicized. Ultimately, now we see it politicized more as Republican versus Democrat. Um, back in the day, I think back in those days, it wasn't quite so clear. Um, there were folks on both sides on both sides. Um, but uh, but but that's really been, I think, um, uh, a polarizing the a good bit of the polarizing thing. Plus the de the decision on the part of Republicans to uh, align to really go with evangelical Christian voters and try to attract them mm. um, and to build an alliance there and the politics of abortion, the politics around feminism, the second wave of feminism, all of that is all um, part of, I mean, it's all, they're all inter intertwined with one another, I would say. Yeah, I have an easy solution to this. Oh, good. Uh, are you ready for this? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Uh, each LGBTQ person gets 10 votes instead of one vote. I like that idea. <laughs> and that will completely solve this problem. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the problem we have is that we don't have enough, enough people there. Right. You know, if politicians get very interested, then the groups get big. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in, you know, well, I, I guess I'd say it's very interesting to see what's happened in our country, in the U.S. specifically, since um, since the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage. And um, I mean, generationally, there's a big difference. And, the, you know, really, the needle has changed um, around at least around lesbian and gay issues. If the trans issues and, you know, other kinds of gender identity issues are now more the hot button issue um, these days. But um, but it's it's really interesting to see how that's how those those issues have changed, even among, say, evangelical Christians, particularly of a younger generation. Um, you know, evangelical churches, too, are shrinking now. For a while, that wasn't the case. And they're having, they're, they're finding it increasingly difficult to, um, to reach younger people, um, in part because of their stances on, their stances on sexuality, especially. Right, right. Yeah. yeah in the paper, and you, you say, uh, what benefit a feminist perspective could offer uh, remains largely unexplored. So you're talking about Judith Butler, mm -hmm. and her, some of her views mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that is the case? Well, I think it's the, I think it's been largely unexplored because of that kind of polarization that we we're describing um, a minute ago of, you know, um, and figuring out then how exactly to address that polarization is tricky. Um, and I think um, scholars can get caught up in that too. Um, so one of the reasons I, I do think Judith Butler's work is really helpful here, um, in part because she is, well, how do I put this? She complicates for us and provides some really helpful tools, a really helpful framework for thinking about um, how we, how gender and sexuality really do come together for us and yeah. how, how they come together in ways that enforce particular kinds of social norms. Um, with the, and also keeping open then the possibility of resistance to those social norms and recognizing that those social norms are um, are only as strong as we make them, if you will. Um, not that they're not strong, but, you know, only as strong as we make them. So I can talk a little bit about Butler's work if you think that would be helpful and not too geeky or yeah, nerdy. That's, yeah? That's really, yeah. Okay. Um, so Judith Butler has what puts forward what she calls this kind of performative understanding of gender. Um, 
And she means by that, not that we, it gets misunderstood often as um, the idea that gender is a performance that I consciously um, put on certain clothes and take up a role like an actor does um, yeah. on stage. It's not that at all. That, um, you know, if you think about like, let's go back to um, my binary system, my sketch of that binary system of uh, yeah. sex, gender, and sexuality. What's the first thing that happens when a baby's born? You know, <laughs> they look at it and they say, oh, it's a boy or it's a girl, right? Um, and depending on what they say, what the doctor says, what that pronouncement is, then that is going to uh, impact, in fact, how that child is raised um, and how that child is perceived. So, um, you know, we have this idea that, you know, we associate pink with girls and blue with boys. Um, yeah. There was a time when that was reversed, actually. Um, blue was associated <laughs> with girls and pink with boys, which I think is fascinating. Um, yeah. But, you know, th through the colors that we dress our children in, through the toys we give them to play with, um, through all those things, we are, um, we are, uh, teaching them, in a sense, our expectations for how we expect them to act and who we expect them to be. And right. we're training them in that, right? That yeah. doesn't mean it doesn't happen without resistance. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many uh, stories I've heard from, I mean, I was a, I was a pretty compliant kid, I have to say. Um, but um, Yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, and sometimes unconsciously, right? right. People, people say things like, you know, yeah, it, it, the the boy is playing the trucks and the uh, and the girls are playing the dolls or something. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah, and so it is it is a it's reinforced learning, right, right? Right, it absolutely is. Or even how we walk, how we sit, how we you know how we throw a ball, you know, all those kinds of things are um, are ways that we are taught to and enculturated in what it means to be a girl or a boy, a man or a woman, ultimately, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's what she means by performative. Um, and what we and, and the problem we have is that in that binary system that assumes that acting feminine, desiring a man is basically just the normal, natural outgrowth of being born a woman. Right. Being born, a, born a girl is that we right. are placing we're act, asking the body to be this guarantor of this social system really and the body is simply not up to that task that's what science is showing us right that the body simply is not up to that task the body is showing us that all these things are so much more complicated than we um than that system will allow for so um so that's i think one way in which in which butler is really or many ways in which butler is really helpful in helping us giving us language to articulate that difference in a way that acknowledges the um, overwhelming, we might say, pressures of the normative, but also shows us the op the opportunities for resistance and for you know for behaving otherwise, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we have a few different experiments running, right? So my perception is that democratic countries uh, appear to be a little more flexible compared to autocratic systems. Uh, like Russia, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so how these countries, if you see cross-sectional differences uh, between countries, how they how they perceive this, uh, how kids are raised and so mm -hmm. on, able to get some uh, outcomes data from there, right? Have you seen mm -hmm. anything? Well, I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, one of the things that I think would be really interesting to to trace would be um, would be how those differences get navigated actually in real life. Uh, for yeah. example, um, one like I, as I mentioned, well, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I'll I'll put it out here now. Um, yeah, you know that binary system that I'm talking about is really kind of a Western construction and a Western invention. Um, that mm. got exported to uh, the rest of the world through colonialism and globalization and so on. 
Um, the reality in many parts of the world, um, I talk about Africa specifically in um, my book, Signs and Wonders, and the one chapter there. Um, the reality yeah. is that um, that the experiences and the ways of the taxonomies, if you will, of relationships that were present in a lot of African countries were much more fluid than that. Um, hmm. And and really worked according to a different and more complicated system. So um, so we have, there is this potential, you might say, um, maybe deeply buried in a culture in those cultures DNA, if I may, yeah. Um, yeah. that can be mobilized to uh, to good effect um, if um, if we if we were to choose to do so. So. Um, and there, there again, I'm, it seems to me that it's in part, uh, in part, yes, maybe a, that democratic regimes are better at uh, at managing that and being open to that. But it also, I think, has a lot to do with the role of religion and particularly the role of Christianity in many uh, in many of these countries that are former colonies. Um, yeah. So. So I think I think there's a there's a lot of potential there. It's um, but it but it remains to be seen whether it will be realized. And one thing that concerns me in particular is you know this kind of stereotyping that we sometimes do between in in Christianity now I'm talking about um, yeah. that it's the more conservative the global South is more conservative about sexuality issues and the global North is more liberal and we just we just we you know we're just going to have to split up you know there's so many denominations right now christian denominations that are facing um that kind of that kind of issue and um and my worry there is if if that split does happen then the you know the lgbtq people and their allies in the global south um will what's going to happen to them um are they going to be left without allies from the global north whom they need, right? They may need and may want. On the other hand, how how do we do allyship in a way that is respectful of cultural difference? It goes in a way. This gets back to cosmopolitanism and perhaps its limits. Um, how do we do allyship in a way that is um, that is acknowledges and works with and recognizes differences as opposed to simply trying to smooth them over with money, you know, to go back to globalization again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I keep thinking that um, uh, maybe I'm trying to make it too scientific, mm -hmm. Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> thinking that we have a lot of different experiments yeah. going on. You, you mentioned that at the West exported the binary classification uh, it to the colonies, uh, but many we have you know a lot of uh, uh, previous colonies mm -hmm. now. Have they shown any trends to revert back to initial conditions? Um, have you seen anything like in Africa? There are Australia? there are at least hints of it, um, in, in, and they don't necessarily have the endorsement of a of a government necessarily. But um, yeah. but yes, like I mean, well, South Africa would be an example um, that South Africa has. Uh, come a great distance in terms of LGBTQ inclusion um, in recent years. Um, uh, other African countries, not so much yet. Um, and this is another place where cosmopolitanism is kind of a mixed bag. Um, you know, the United Nations has, and, and the U.S., at least in well, prior administrations before Trump, um, really tried to encourage and push um, countries, African countries, and um, you know, to be more progressive when it comes to LB, LGBTQ issues. And that can be, a, that can be um, you know, kind of a, a mixed bag, because on the one hand, that's echoes of colonialism, which you're trying to escape, right? Um, and on the yeah. other hand, I mean, you know, it, it's like, well, okay, could we kind of move in that direction? So where I look to and what I see in a lot of those countries are actually um, local and indigenous folks who are trying to do the work. Um, and, um, and that's, I think, where the real hope lies. Um, and, and that's where I would like to see, um, say, Western Christianity um, or other LGBTQ organizations in the, in the West, um, say, align themselves with those folks, learn from them and ask them, what do you need that we can that we can help you with, as opposed to 
you know, coming in like the, you know, savior figures and, okay, we've got what, we know what you need and we can give it to you. So I li really like your idea of social experimentation and, you know, that those social experimentations need to be local. They need to draw on whatever the local resources are and local versions of sexuality and gender might be rather than um, importing wholesale from somewhere else, whatever those, um, those uh, expectations might be. Right, right. So, so in conclusion, Ellen, I just want to get uh, your thoughts on this. Um, this is purely an opinion uh, from my perspective. Uh, when I look, look out, uh, what I'm seeing is really segmentation schemes increasing right. yeah. in the world. Um, race, religion, color mm -hmm. of the skin, belief, education, wealth, uh, countries, whatever, you know, it, it just... Uh, so we, we have more and more micro segmentation. Uh, it goes back to this idea of the Dunbar's number, mm -hmm. right? It used to be that plants never really succeeded when they exceeded 150. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they start to mm -hmm. fight uh, and mm -hmm. split up. Um, I don't know the modern Dunbar's number could be higher than 150, but we are seeing signs and mm -hmm. symptoms of sort of the mm -hmm. disease. Um, so what I want to ask you is, do you agree with that mm -hmm. observation? And if so, uh, how do you think it's going to going to uh, change as we look forward yeah. five, ten years? Um, that's a great question. And I, I do, I do uh, sadly agree with you that that's, that's the tendency right now. Um, I would like to hope that maybe... <laughs> This might be too strong, um, that maybe one of the things that coming out of a global pandemic might do is make us yeah. aware of how deeply connected we are. Um, and right. that, you know, fighting a virus like COVID-19, for example, um, that can't be done successfully simply by erecting fences. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we... Yeah. We share the same, as you were saying, we share the same DNA and not just with each other, other human beings, but with the, with every organism on the planet. One of my very favorite cartoons is from the New Yorker from years ago. And it's these two balding kind of white guys sitting on the back of one of, of the yacht, right? And the yacht's called the yeah. High D Ho. And they are being <laughs> waited on by these lovely nubile um, young women in bikinis, you know, who are bringing them cocktails. And one of them says to the other, not bad for someone who shares 98% of their DNA with the common flatworm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think recognizing our, um, our deep biological uh, connection with all of the organisms that populate this planet um, might be a way out of the fragmentation that you're describing. Um, I mentioned COVID-19, but certainly the global climate crisis is another thing that, you know, we can't address that just by putting up fences either. Yes, it requires right. sovereign nations to take action, but, and the same thing with fighting COVID-19, take sovereign nations to take action, but Cosmopolitanism is ultimately what's going to save the day, um, or some version of it, a healthier version of it, perhaps, than we've had. So, you know, I think we right. have the resources, the conceptual resources, the biological resources, the intellectual resources, the ethical resources, the emotional resources that we can, that, that can address these global crises by um, recognizing connection. But whether we'll be able to do that or not, whether we'll be able to marshal them to that end or not, I don't know. But I want to do everything that I can in the time that's left to me to try to help make that happen. Yeah, let's be optimistic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Excellent, Ellen. Thanks so much yeah, for spending time It was time great. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity, Gil. Yeah. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. 
If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.